And welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining and special shout out to those of you who are brand new to the campaign tonight. I know there are a bunch of you that attended action calls last month who are just joining for the first time. So if we haven't met, my name is Diane and I'm an organizer here at the Center for Biological Diversity. And I'm on the call tonight with several of my colleagues here at the center. So uh, let's start out with some introductions. Ash, do you want to kick us off? Hey folks, great to see you again. I'm Ash Loth. I work out of Oakland, California, and I'm the engagement manager with this uh, with the center. Uh, and I will pass it over to Tanya. Thanks, Ash. As Ash just said, my name is Tanya Sanrib. I'm the international legal director, and I'm in Seattle, Washington. And I'll turn it over to Brett. Hey, everyone. I'm Brett Hartle. I'm the government affairs director, and I'm based in Arizona. And I think I'm sending it back to Diane. Sweet. Thanks so much. Uh, Ash, do you want to run us through our agenda for tonight? Yeah, absolutely. Excited for tonight. So first off, as you'll see on your, the screen in front of you, um, we're going to talk about wildlife trade. Um, we're going to get some updates and we're going to talk with the amazing experts on the line. Then we'll run over how to meet with your senator. We'll do a short training and then we'll finish by uh, going through a question and answer. So I'm just going to kick it off. Uh, Tanya, for the folks who are new, can you give us a brief overview of why we're here tonight working to end the wildlife trade? Like, why is this so important and relevant right now? Yeah, thanks, Ash. That's a great question. I mean, I think a lot of us are here right now because we're realizing it's not enough to just make it through this pandemic, right? We need to think about the next one, the one that's on the horizon, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that never happens. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is just understanding what's the cause of this pandemic. Um, and the virus that's causing COVID-19 and the devastating pandemic that's sweeping around the world, it's a zoonotic disease. What does that mean? Well, that means it came, it came from an animal. So if we want to fight against the next pandemic before it happens, we need to change our relationship with wildlife and nature. Sort of stepping back and putting this pandemic in context of all the infectious diseases that are out there, the zoonoses, the diseases that come from animals, they're about 60% of the infectious diseases. But of all of the zoonoses, about 70% of them come from wildlife. Scientists say that the next epidemic or pandemic is most likely to come from wildlife. And recent research is documenting just how dangerous wildlife trade or exploitation of wildlife really is in terms of disease emergence. A 2005 estimate put live trade in wildlife at about 40,000 primates, 4 million birds, 640,000 reptiles, 350 million tropical fish a year. And since the U.S. consumes roughly 20% of the global wildlife market, living and dead, ending that trade is a great place to start. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You know, some research has actually come out recently about how these diseases spread in the wildlife trade. And so what's the latest on that? Yeah, there's a number of really interesting stories, um, studies out there on this point. So a very, very recent paper came out and it tracked coronavirus loading in rodents in Vietnam. And not surprisingly, the animals' viral loads increased the longer that they were in the trade supply chain. So the stress, the exposure to new and different animals, it all works together and it shows that animals that are in trade have more diseases. Now, that isn't the only paper that we've seen. There were studies that were done actually in, after the outbreak of SARS back in 2003, 2004, looking at civets, which are thought to be the intermediary animal that resulted in the SARS outbreak. So it went from bats to civets to people. Anyways, that study looked at antibodies in civets that were bred on farms and civets that had been brought to market. And not surprisingly, the civets that had traveled along the supply chain and ended up in the market had more antibodies, which meant that they had suffered more diseases. The other study that just came out though, that I think is interesting, mostly because it's near and dear to my heart because it deals with pangolins. And for those of you guys who don't know pangolins, they're the most highly trafficked mammals in the world. 
And while commercial trade in penguins is banned, unfortunately, there's still a lot of trade that's taking place in the black market in penguins. What this study did is they looked at pangolins that were confiscated early on in the trade supply chain. So these were pangolins that were caught in their country of origin. They weren't trafficked internationally. Those pangolins didn't test positive for coronaviruses, but pangolins that were further, presumed to be further along in the trade chain and had been there for some time, they tested positive not just for several different kinds of coronaviruses, which is the virus that's one of the viruses that's causing COVID-19, but other diseases as well. So basically what these studies are showing is that trade stresses wildlife. And that means that animals are more likely to get diseases, they're more likely to spread diseases that they have. And when you put those stressed animals from different species together in cramped cages in the trade supply chain, we create the perfect storm for infectious diseases to emerge. So you have unsanitary conditions during transport or at markets where animals are processed and the products are, are sold for food. Wildlife trade really truly is the perfect storm for these types of diseases to come about. Oh my gosh, this sounds horrible. Uh, you know, many people are calling this pandemic a once in a lifetime or even a once in a century event. So what do you think? Is it true that, uh, that we can expect more of this in the future, Tanya? It is true, Ash. I'm sorry to say I don't have any good news for you on this point. You know, and I really think we have to start looking at this pandemic as a symptom of our extinction crisis. As our population grows, as we continue to quest for more wildlife, enter new habitats, we increase our disease risk. We've seen some of the worst zoonotic diseases emerge, things like HIV, Ebola, SARS, MERS, now COVID-19, all zoonotic diseases, they all came about over the last 40 years. The two key drivers of these types of zoonotic diseases emerging are also the top two drivers of the extinction crisis, their exploitation of wildlife and their habitat loss. So scientists say that unless we change our unhealthy relationship with wildlife and nature, more diseases are gonna emerge and we're gonna to continue to lose species to the extinction emergency. Yeah, well, thanks, Tanya. Thanks for that update. Um, so given that we know that the spread of these diseases is linked to wildlife trade, it seems like ending the wildlife trade uh, to prevent future diseases is just a no brainer. So Brett, I want to turn it over to you. Is this the feeling that you're getting in DC right now? Like are decision makers looking at wildlife trade legislation as a way to prevent future crises like the one we're in right now? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, we've seen some really positive uh, signs. You know, there's definitely a growing awareness, um, both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democratic alike, that uh, we need to really address the root cause of the um, of these types of pandemics, and that's the exploitation of wildlife. Um, we had members of Congress asking Dr. Fauci if we should shut down live wildlife markets. Uh, members are speaking and tweeting about the connection between wildlife trade and COVID. Um, there was actually just a hearing the other day uh, in the Senate about wildlife trade and the need to shut it down, and the Republican and Democrat witnesses alike were talking about um, agreeing that we need to do more. Um, and there's been legislation in the works, and, and some of it's actually really close. I know we said that for folks on the last call, um, but it's really, really close now. Um, I'm still feeling really optimistic. Um, but the reality is, you know, if you're watching the news in D.C., um, it's very challenging right now to, to create legislation and pass legislation. Um, they're just, it's just difficult, and, and people can see that in the news, what's playing out right now with negotiations. But um, this next period of time, um, especially leading up to what's called the lame duck, which is the period after the election, is really the, one of the times when Congress legislates the most. So it's really important to be gearing up for that fight right now. Yeah, all right. And that's pretty much coming around the corner. That's like, what, three months from now or so? Pretty close. 91 days. Oh boy. <laughs> so, okay, so obviously now is the time to raise this issue in Congress and we have momentum there, it sounds like. So what should we be asking specifically from members of Congress? Yeah, so, you know, the key message is, you know, one, I think that these are, this is solvable, this is preventable. 
Um, this is not like an unknown. We actually know what we need to do and that's to stop the wildlife trade. But you can't do that without money. Um, it takes manpower, resources. That's the really the key thing. There, there was actually a paper in the journal Science that came out maybe two weeks ago, a bunch of leading scientists from around the world that said that all it would take is to spend about 2% um, of the total that the world has already spent to fight COVID to actually prevent the next pandemic. So that's roughly $20, 22000000000 billion, um, but it's nothing compared to the 10 to 20 trillion that we are spending in response to this. And you know, members of Congress saw that and picked it up. Uh, Representative Pocan uh, from Wisconsin even tweeted about it saying like, look, you know, if we reduce the Pentagon budget 10%, we could fund all of that to prevent to protect prevent the wildlife trade and still have 51 billion to spare. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks, Brett. That's really, really good info to have. And as some of you might guess, this month we're going to be meeting with senators and asking them for exactly that. Allocate resources to end the wildlife trade and prevent future pandemics. Last month was all about building power and raising awareness about wildlife trade and its link to human health. Um, and so what you'll see on the slide right now um, is we're gonna start using this power. So to do that, many of you hosted online um, action calls. We got so many awesome pictures of all of you and you can see a few of them on the screen right now. Um, in fact, many of the people that you talk to uh, are on the call tonight. Um, and that's what building power is all about. Um, and now that we've gotten everyone on board, it's time to use our power and take it directly to our elected officials. So that being said, we are also in pretty unprecedented times. So Diane, can you lead us through this like new creative space we're in. How do we actually set up a meeting with our senators during COVID-19 when, when we just can't show up at their offices? Yeah, absolutely. So I am going to share my screen quickly. So bear with me for a second and I will show everybody how to um, access our guide and just go through some of the steps here. So I'm gonna go here to nwildlifetrade.org and we'll send this link out to you tomorrow. Um, and right here, you'll see how to lobby to end wildlife trade. So step one, find your senators. If you don't know who your senators are yet, we have this link here. You can click on this and it'll take you to this page where you can look it up. So for example, I will go to North Carolina and here you can actually click right on the senator's name to go to their website and um, figure out how to set up your meeting. So you'll wanna go to their contact page and you'll either have a scheduling request uh, button or you can go to office locations, find one near you and look for the phone number there. All right, so now you know who your senator is, you know their contact information, come back to the guide and we'll go to step two, set up your meeting. So we've actually created a sample email for you to keep this super simple. Uh, we also have a sample script for a phone call. So you can just click right here and see that and copy and paste it into an email. I won't go through that now, but you can see that tonight or tomorrow when you're going through here. And so you've reached out, you've set up your meeting. Step three, decide who's coming. So you can do this solo if you'd like to. Um, if you prefer to do it on your own, that's totally fine. You can also invite a few friends to join you. Um, keep in mind that this will probably be like a 15 to 20 minute meeting with a senator staffer. So we recommend keeping your groups uh, at five or smaller just so that everyone has enough time to talk and so that you are respectful of the staffer's time and don't go over. All right, so step four, you've got your group or you've got your plan on your own and you want to go through your script and talking points to get ready. So we've got all of that here for you in this worksheet. So you can come here 
decide on your roles if you have a group, and then read through your agenda. And those of you who have done things like this before, you know that we've got all this laid out for you. Again, I won't go through it all tonight, but you can read that here when you're getting ready for your meeting. Okay, so you've practiced, you're ready to go, your meeting's coming up, and next you'll just want to send out reminders. Remind everybody that it's happening the day before, and you'll have a great meeting. And then afterwards, uh, you'll want to follow up both with us and with the staffers. So we have, again, uh, an email template for you to send to the staffer and that's really important because you want to build a good relationship with them. You want to thank them for their time and follow up to get any information to them that they ask you for as well as to get a response from the senator. You'll want to follow up with us too in a really quick report back form right here. Um, this is just so that we have this information both for this campaign and moving forward. Um, so that we'll know which senators we're already talked to and um, which ones we still need to contact. So that's it. It's super simple. Um, and we'll be here for questions along the way too. So if anything comes up, you can always reach out to us. And with that, I will pass it back over to Ash. Thanks, Diane. Seems really easy. Seems totally doable. And it seems completely necessary right now. Uh, this is go, go, Um Now that we've heard from our experts, Tanya, about what's at stake here, we've heard from Brett about why the time is now, we've heard from Diane about how we can actually make this happen. Now is the time for you to take action with us. Um, and I wanna know, um, you'll see a poll pop up on your screen I want to know if you are ready to answer that call, step up to the plate, and join us. Will you set up a virtual meeting with your senator to tell them to end the wildlife trade? And if you're game, go ahead and press yes. If you're curious, go ahead and press yes, because we are going to be here for you every step of the way. We're going to support you. We have plenty of resources to make sure that you're set up for success. So if you are on the phone tonight, Unfortunately, you won't see this poll. However, you will get a follow-up email in your inbox tomorrow where you can sign up to do this. Um, again, wildlife trade, we know it's connected with the pandemic that we're in right now. That's why it's so important to talk to your senators and your members of Congress. And this is the perfect opportunity for you to sign up right now on this phone and work with us to make sure that happens. All right, um, so I'm gonna give us maybe a few seconds more. Again, if you're amped, go ahead, say yes. If you're maybe on the fence, wanna learn more about it, just say yes, because we're here for you. All right, going once, going twice. All right, thank you to everyone who signed up. We're gonna close the poll now. And, uh, I just want to say thank you again for, to everyone who signed up. It's an important moment to, to be in. If you, between now and tomorrow morning, decide that, yeah, I actually want to sign up, don't worry, it's going to be in your inbox tomorrow morning. You can sign up uh, through the link in your email. Okay, so soon I'm going to pass it back to Diane to uh, run through question and answer. But first, I just wanted to give a quick glimpse into the future so that all of you know what's coming up. Um, no surprises, it's an election. We are 90 days, 91 days from a historic election and it's coming during a global pandemic. This month, we have to tell our senators that wildlife needs to end immediately to prevent another crisis like the one that we're in. But at the same time, we also need to be giving our all to get out the vote for wildlife and for the environment. Many of our friends, our neighbors, colleagues, etc., will need help getting information on how to vote in this rapidly changing and disorienting landscape. So for those of you who have been us, with us for a while, you know that we've been building power and getting the word out about issues that we hold deeply in our hearts. 
And like I said before, it is time to use that power. Like now is the time. Use, let's use that hammer. We want the folks who stand with us on these issues to be the ones get elected. We want those who are strong on the environment and on wildlife to be the ones who step into office. And so that means over the next few months, things were, are gonna, yeah, they're gonna look a little different. All right, but we'll be, uh, we're asking you to participate with us. So we'll be watching for updates and action points on wildlife trade, and we'll be reaching out to you to take action when it's needed. At the same time, we'll also be asking you to engage your networks to vote for the environment. And that means you're gonna be helping get out folks that you know to again, get folks into office who are environmental champions. So please keep an eye out for that over the coming weeks, months. Uh, wonderful, okay, cool. With that, I'm gonna hand it back to Diane for question and answer. Um, thanks, Ash. Um, so there are so many of you on the call tonight um, and the number keeps going up here. So we unfortunately won't get to all the questions. Many of you know the drill here, but we will get to as many as we can um, and try to stay respectful of your time too. Um, if we don't get to your question really quick, uh, you can either reply to the follow-up email tomorrow or you can join us on Slack if you're not there already. So Slack is our online community where you'll find upcoming actions, um, a live Q&A session with staff and one-on-one -on -one support from staff and other volunteers. Um, and also this Friday at noon Pacific, three Eastern time, we'll have a live Q&A with Tanya and myself. Um, about this campaign specifically, where you can ask questions about wildlife trade and also about meeting with your senators. Um, so Kelly is going to share the link to join us on Slack in the chat box now, if you'd like to join us there. Um, if we don't get to your question, you can ask it there. Um, and if you're on the phone, you may not be able to access that right now, but it will also be in the follow-up email. All right, let me see these questions. Um, bear with me while I sort through here. Um, all right, uh, how do we choose? Okay, so a few people have said if, if we only have time to meet for meet with one senator, um, how do we choose which one? Brett, do you have any ideas on that? Um. If you live in a state with, I mean, it, at some level, it doesn't matter. Um, some, if you if you look on each senator's website, you will often see in their about section um, what committees they are on. Um, so some senators will be on things like the Environment and Public Works Committee or the Appropriations Committee or even like the Foreign Affairs Committee, which will obviously touch on a lot of the international aspects of the wildlife trade. So if you can only meet with one and you're, you're sort of, you know, maybe both are Democrats or both are Republicans, so they're sort of ideologically the same, I would pick the one that has an actual uh, sort of part of their job, jurisdiction over these types of issues. Um, so if they're only doing things like taxes and agriculture and banking go with the other one. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, you have to do like a little research, but pretty much every senator will have that on their website very prominently and you should be able to find that very easily to make that decision. Thanks, Brett. I'll also add on there, um, if you join Slack, that's also a great place to coordinate with other people. So if you could always type in there like, hey, I'm in this state and I'm gonna meet with one of the senators, is anybody else meeting with one of them so we can cover both or something like that. So that's another option too. Um, okay, let's see. Um, so we, we have covered this question on previous webinars, but we're getting it a bunch. And I think just because we have a lot of new folks 
Um, wondering about when ending the wildlife trade just drive it um, into a black market and uh, yeah, what, what our thoughts are on that. Do you wanna go first, Tanya? No, I think you have, I think you have the slam dunk on this one, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I mean, this is obviously an issue that, that shows up in any context. Um, where there's a law that is being put into place or an activity that's being prohibited. You know, yes, a small amount of it is driven underground. You know, some of it is underground already. Um, but most people comply and, and, and when things are ended, they, they find alternatives. You know, one of the reasons, again, that we're emphasizing that funding is so key is that the way you end it is, is you both address the law enforcement issue and you help people transition to different livelihoods so that they have a viable alternative so they don't turn to the black market. Um, is it gonna be part of you know, our future to deal with the black market side too? Yes, but that's not a, a good excuse to not take action because in the aggregate, we're making things way better if we're pushing to end the wildlife trade. And, and that's why it needs to be a large sort of you know, funded effort and, and frankly, a global effort. Um, so yes, but it's not a good reason to not act. Yeah, like Brett said last time, you know, we have laws that prohibit people from killing each other. That doesn't mean that we don't have murders still, tragically, sadly, but that's not a reason to not have those laws, right? I mean, they obviously have an effect. They're preventative, they're beneficial. There's lots of people who are law-abiding and they're gonna follow the law. So it is really essential that not only we throw up these bans, that cuts down demand for the products, dries out the supply chains, it's all really important. But it also is crucial for us, as Brett said, again, on the funding side, to make sure that not only are we drying down those supply chains, but we're transitioning livelihoods so that they aren't being converted to the black market, they're being converted to something else. Thank you. All right. Um... Uh, Susan is asking after this webinar, will you be emailing out these slides with uh, the examples and everything for lobbying? Um, we will send out an email, I believe tomorrow morning, uh, with the link there. You can also go to endwildlifetrade.org if you want to access it uh, even sooner. <laughs> you can set up your meeting tonight if you want to. Um, but we will send it out tomorrow along with the Slack link for those of you on the phone. Um, to join us there. Um, a few people are asking about where they can find the stats and the studies that Tanya mentioned. Yeah, if you can join us on Slack on Friday, I am happy to send along all of those papers so you guys can follow and see for yourselves. But yeah, there's a lot of really great scientific research, in particular on the US market. We're one of the few countries in the world that collects all of, all of our wildlife import and export data. So a lot of those studies really are focused on the US and they really do show what a great role we play worldwide in terms of driving wildlife trade. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, a few folks asking uh, if when meeting with their senators, um, should they mention the PAW and FIN Act that we've worked on before or any other bills or just focus on um, the end wildlife trade acts? Um, I would focus primarily on the wildlife trade ask right now. You know, I think, um, you know, we had a really good plan <laughs> on Pond Finn and, and it's still important and it's still important to like build power. But right now, you know, given the pandemic, uh, given where we are sort of in the remainder of the Congress. And again, if you watch the news and you see how difficult it is to do anything, um, that's really gotta be the focus right now. Um, we've done a great job on Pond Finn. We have shown that it is a top level thing to be addressed and it will be front and center again in 2021 um, when we you know, continue to fight to repeal the Trump era uh, regulations. Um, so that fight's not going away. Um, the challenge is if you start to bring in more than one topic, your, your message gets a little confused and muddled. Um, and it's better, I mean, when I do my own lobbying, I, I really try to just stay focused on the task at hand 
even if I mean I know that I have to come back to that same office later and, and do another meeting, it's it's more effective than than sort of giving them everything you, you care about because then they kind of get confused about what's the most important thing that they should be thinking about right now. So I I would suggest just staying focused on this. We haven't forgotten about Pond Fin. It's you know, it's gonna be one of the most important things we focus on in early 2021. And we're going to keep fighting that those Trump era, uh, Trump rollbacks. But right now, you know, given the fact that the pandemic is center in people's minds, it's the only news story. It's it's, it's still devastating the country. I would I would just stay focused on that. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have a few people asking about um, how to coordinate with others in their area how to see if somebody else has already scheduled a meeting with a senator to join in on their call. Um, so I'm going to be a broken record here. Slack is the best place to coordinate with each other. There is a good chance if you post in there, somebody else is in the same state. Um, and you can see there, it's also okay if there are more than one meeting like this with the same senator, that's likely to happen. And that just shows that more people are passionate about this issue and, and really want this to get pushed through. So, um, all right, let's see. This person is asking, is there a record of where each senator stands on this issue already? Um, and the second part of their question, a lot of people have this question actually, are we referring to a specific piece of legislate, legislation or just asking them to end wildlife trade? So do the second one first, because it's easier. I think right now the, the ask is going to be end the wildlife trade, give us money. Um, like I said, we're still really hoping and it's very close and I'm still, I'm still optimistic we're gonna have a bill to rally around, but we're not quite there. If that happens in the next few days, which is quite possible, but I'm not gonna like say it's, it's a certainty, we may refine the ask and say, yes, go for this, but we don't know for sure quite yet. Um, again, it's just been a really challenging time on in DC to get bills passed. I'll just say as a very quick anecdote, you know, I, just recently we had a bill introduced that we've been helping with for a very, very, very long time. It, it sometimes takes you know, a year so it's not taking that long this, for this particular issue, but it's just, it's always slower than you wish. On the first part of the question, the specifics of wildlife trade, probably not so much. Um, you could obviously look at their websites. Uh, you could go to the LCV scorecard to get a generic sense of where your member is on environmental issues and wildlife. Um, you know, our affiliate um, C4 organization Center for Biological Diversity Action Fund also has a scorecard that, that tries to rank uh, senators, but you're not gonna find a, a specific ranking on wildlife trade, but you can generally extrapolate members that are strong on the environment are probably gonna be strong on this, and those that are weak will be weak. Makes sense. Alrighty. Um... Let's see. Um, so Cheryl is asking about um, how can we help if we know that our senators are already in support of ending wildlife trade? Yeah, I mean, um, just because they're in favor of our position doesn't mean they, they, they don't need to hear it because they're probably in favor of many positions and they have to prioritize and think about what's important. So it, you know, even the strongest environmental champions are also championing dozens of other things simultaneously. They need to hear from people that it's important so that they know to actually prioritize it. I mean, that's, you know, I do lobbying all the time. It's difficult in this era, it's all Zoom calls and phone calls, but it, it, it's stronger when multiple people are saying the same thing because that trickles up. Um, I, I used to work on the Hill and you know, they tell their bosses, you know, when they get calls and whatnot, they compile those numbers and they say, these are the things people care about right now. So that's what you should be focusing on. So if we don't do that, they'll still be on the right side on the issue, but that doesn't mean they're going to put effort in to make something happen. Um, 
All right, Diane is asking, why are we focusing on senators and not House representatives? Because, um, because unfortunately, so many things go to die in the Senate, and the Senate is really key to making things happen, that we think here it makes more sense to focus on, on getting something out of the Senate as challenging as it is. You know, if you're, again, if you're watching sort of the recent events, the House is constantly sending ideas and legislation over there only to sort of meet a, a slow death in the Senate. But the interesting thing about the lame duck period in particular, right now, like we still haven't passed a budget for 2021. They haven't passed a defense bill for 2021. They haven't passed all the stimulus things they still want to accomplish. There's opportunities to potentially add types of this type of legislation into those, any of those bills. Right? This is a national defense issue, like we're, our country is getting hammered by this. It's a funding issue, it's an appropriations issue, it's a stimulus recovery issue, but it's the Senate that's gonna decide what sort of you know, catches a ride and what doesn't. Um, so that's why we're focusing here on the Senate. Um, you know, sometimes it makes sense to start in the House because you know, one, we can actually accomplish something like in the short term, like trying to, to move a bill just sort of for the, you know, the purpose of getting it actually debated but here, this is really about like getting this into the final deal. And it's the Senate that's the linchpin and that's why we have to do it even though it's more difficult. Okay, thank you. Um, this one, again, I think we have addressed in the past, but for the new folks, um, are there things that we can do at the local level to work to end wildlife trade? Well, I'll just say, you know, we've, we've started to see, at least at the state level, a little bit of movement, um, especially in California. California's kind of got a, a bill that's sort of moving. It's that, that may also address this types, these types of issues. Uh, we, we, we hope to maybe see uh, similar efforts in other states also potentially come together. Um, at the local level, there, there's probably a little, I'm, I'm gonna pass it off to Tanya, like states and feds is where, where probably the most effective action could be. But I suppose there's ways we could we could think about it. Although I'm, I'd have to brainstorm for a moment, so I'm gonna I'm gonna punt. <laughs> well, I think the other thing too that's really crucial is just thinking about you know U.S. demand and how that fuels wildlife trade. And so it's really crucial that we raise awareness about what are we what are the products we bring into our homes, what are our friends buying, what are our communities buying, and how can we teach people that hey that cool skull you just got for your office comes from a primate and maybe that's not something that we should be buying anymore or that bat that's encased in acrylic or oh all of your paintbrushes are made out of rodent hair you know that came from animals that are in the trade supply chain you know all of that adds to um our demand for wildlife that fuels the trade and that's part of the problem so i think as individuals we have a lot of power to be conscious about what we're buying and bringing into our homes For sure. Um, another popular question. Um, a few folks are asking about, uh, do we have suggestions if their senators are, quote, a lost cause? There are a few senators that are a lost cause. That's true. But I think many in this situation are um, more open to the issue because again, just like the science paper, I think they appreciate perhaps that spending trillions to, to clean up a pandemic is not an efficient way to go and are maybe a little bit more open-minded than they used to be. You know, again, I can only, I can't say publicly quite yet who we are working with on the other side of the aisle, but I think people will be surprised at how, how some of this comes about and potentially how bipartisan this could be. Again, no promises, it could all still fall apart. There's a you know, saying in DC that nothing is agreed upon until everything is agreed upon. But if it comes together, it could be very bipartisan. And yes, there may be still be those you know, truly um, ideological rigid people on the conservative right wing side of things that are unmovable. But I think a lot are, are potentially um, persuadable here because they can appreciate how how significant this has been to the world and why we need to, to, to address it. 
But if you live in one of those states where you have a truly like unmovable person, yeah, I know, it sucks. They still should hear from you because if they don't, then they assume everything they're doing is right when it isn't. So true. Uh, okay, in talking about election stuff, um, we have a few questions about whether or not we endorse candidates at the center. So the center as a nonprofit 501c3, we don't. Um, we have an affiliated 501c4 social welfare organization called the Center for Biological Diversity Action Fund. Uh, many of us will do a little bit of work on the side for that. I, I do um, a, a fair amount, um, but they are separate legal entities with separate rules and separate, separate things. But you will be hearing from that sort of uh, wing of operations shortly, and we will have endorsements probably on, on, on that side um, in the next uh, you know, month or so, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and we have already made some in, in certain races. Um, but just to be totally clear, uh, you know, a 501c3, we don't do any of that. It's a totally different thing legally, but we will have things coming down the pipeline in August and September for folks that are interested, because obviously these are very important elections coming down the road. Definitely. Um, Tanya, I think this one will be for you. Um, why are pangolins so highly traded and how can we satisfy whatever need they fill without them? Yeah, so pangolins, the greatest demand in, for pangolins are for two of their parts. It's for their meat and for their scales. And unfortunately, their scales for a long time have been a part of traditional medicine. Um, in response to the pandemic, and you know, one of the things we haven't really talked a lot about is sort of what are the origins of, of the virus causing COVID-19, but there's some really early papers showing that these confiscated pangolins had a virus that part of it was identical to the virus causing COVID-19. And so there was this theory that pangolins might have been involved somehow in how this virus evolved to be able to infect people. And in response to that, China actually has taken some actions to do some beneficial things for pangolins, but unfortunately they haven't gone the full nine yards. Um, and so I would say on this one, Stay tuned for news tomorrow because we're actually taking some action tomorrow um, to try to fight for pangolins. So look at your inboxes, um, look at the news, and hopefully we'll have a little silver light here for you guys. Thanks, Sonia. All right, we have time for maybe one or two more. Um, let me see here. Uh, Okay, why is addressing the US involvement in wildlife trade so important to stopping it? Like what, what role do we play in it? Yeah, so like I said, you know, the US, when you look at the global wildlife market, the US probably takes up 20%. And that is really significant. So we play a large role in driving the collection of wildlife, the trade in wildlife, um, all of which is, is tied to disease risk. On average, and this is sort of an older figure from a paper, um, we're estimated to import 224 million live animals and 884 wildlife specimens. So that's dead parts and derivatives. That's a lot, that's a lot of wildlife. The other crucial piece to this though, and the reason why we're focusing on ending demand in the US is because this is our home turf, right? It's our market. And we understand how to talk to people in our communities and our families with our friends and really educate them on this issue and drive down demand in our country. You know, I think a lot of us struggle with, oh my gosh, you know, like I was just talking about, you know, demand for these parts of pangolins. And that's, that is generally speaking in a lot of other cultures. And if that's not our cultural background, we don't have the skill set to be able to drive the demand reduction in those places, right? That should be done in a culturally appropriate manner. So what culture do we know best? We know our own. And so that's why it's so important that we take this moment in the US to seize this opportunity to really educate everyone we can. And then the other crucial thing is it's really important that the consumer countries play a role. I think if you look at the news on wildlife trade and the response to the pandemic, by and large, it's a lot of developing countries, China, that have taken action to close markets, to curtail trade, 
what about the consumer countries, the US, the EU? We are a big part of the wildlife problem and we need to recognize that. We can't just point fingers at other countries and other parts of the world. We need to take on our own responsibility. Absolutely. All right, that seems like a good note to close out on. Um, we had 130 questions tonight, so um, I know we didn't get to even a chunk of those, um, but again, please join us on Slack um, on Friday at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern. Um, Tanya and I will be on there to answer all of your questions, and you can also reply to the email that comes tomorrow. Um, if you have any immediate questions about setting up your meeting or anything like that. All right, thank you. And I will pass it over to Ash to close us out. Thanks so much, Diane. And again, thanks to everyone who um, got on the call. Diane said, y'all will be getting email in your inboxes. So please look for that. <laughs> um, it's got a bunch of important information in it. Um, and it's a great way to start Take an action. Um, you can also go to endwildlifetrade.org to find all these resources in one place. And um, hopefully, um, maybe one of my colleagues can paste that in the chat box right now. That's endwildlifetrade.org. Um, and um, remember to add mobilize at biologicaldiversity.org into your email contacts. That way um, you'll be sure to see all these follow-up emails from us directly just in case they get caught into spam. Um, and so you can get all the future updates from us. Um, with that, I just want to thank you again, um, especially for, I'm sure many of us are very zoomed out at this point, um, but we appreciate you taking the time standing with us uh, for something very near and dear to our hearts. Um, and uh, would any of our experts or Diane, like any other uh, uh, positive amp up kind of closing remarks here? I'll give the floor to you if you do. I'll just say real quick thanks to everyone that's you know willing and excited to do this. I mean, I, I do a lot of lobbying and I have a small team of folks that we, we lobby on behalf of the center, but it's just a few of us and we, we do our best, but our ability to amplify our message is so much greater when we have other people joining. I mean, it really does matter, right? If they hear from me, they go, okay, fine, whatever. Hey, lobbyists, blah, blah, blah. But having real people speak up is hugely important and, and it's, it really can move the needle. So I really just appreciate it and, and hope you all have a good time doing it. Yeah, and I know I have like a lot of gloom and doom and some of the things I have to say, but I also think it's an amazing opportunity, right? We stay, here we are standing at this confluence of the extinction crisis, this pandemic that is a symptom of it. And we have this opportunity while the world is shut down and thinking about, oh my gosh, how do we make sure this never happens again to really truly make a difference. And so it's this very short window, this moment in time, we have to seize it. We have to do everything we can. And it's not just about pandemics, it's about our future on this planet. Without the great diversity of species, we're not going to make it. So you're fighting for a future in a lot of different ways. And it's just this amazing moment in time to get to do that. Well, with that, thanks again. And we'll uh, close for the evening. Take care. Bye.